Hello, welcome back to our daily news report on small business financing. This is Jackson Now with No Finance, bringing you the most up-to-date news and insights, stories on small business financing. Have you ever wondered how funding decisions can shape your business's future? Let's dive into those topics today because we have some good news and we also have some bad news for you small business owners out there, especially for the business owners that were affected by Hurricane Milton and Hurricane Helene. It has been reported that, and this came out yesterday, that the funds from the SBA for the EIDL, that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and the Physical Property Damage Loan, those funds have run out for small businesses. So they only had so much set aside and they have completely run out and Congress does not meet again until after the election in November. So uh, many small business owners are worried. Many government officials are worried that they're not going to be able to meet again and get funds out until, you know, at least November. So hopefully they can meet again before then, have an emergency meeting. So we'll keep you all updated on that. There has been approximately 37,000 applications sent in from business owners affected by Hurricane Helene so far. I believe some of those numbers are for Hurricane Milton as well. But obviously this is a dire situation. Have you guys been affected by these disasters? I, I want to know from you guys if you all have sent in your applications. What has your all's experience been so far? Have you gotten denied? Have you gotten approved? We would like to hear from you guys, as well as any other options that are being available to you by your state or local governments. So far, the SBA has made more than 700 loan offers to victims of Hurricane Helene, totaling $48 million. Um, so last year alone, the SBA provided over $3 billion in loans. Um, $770 million was for small businesses and more than $2.3 billion was for homeowners and renters. So from what I've read in my reports, that money is still available for homeowners and renters. Again, the SBA is giving loans in excess of whatever the insurance does not cover or FEMA. So if the insurance is only going to cover 50, 75, 80% of the damages done to your property, whether you're a renter or homeowner or even a business, if those funds do come back for the businesses, then that's where you can reach out to the SBA to see if they'll give you a loan to cover up all the other expenses to either build from the ground up or whatever it was damaged to repair those damages. Okay. And then also I want to highlight just the, the contrast in where the federal government is spending money, because to me, it's laughable. I think we've given out, like the report said, we've given out $48 million so far from what I read last week, that there was $1.6 billion left over for any emergency funds from the SBA for this certain case. Now, obviously. Two really bad hurricanes back to back doesn't happen very often. It seemed like Colleen was even worse with all the flooding on the East Coast the, in Appalachia. But, you know, for them to not have enough money to cover small businesses, I mean, that is what your federal government is, is designed to do, is to be able to help in cases of emergency, to be able to get businesses back on the ground, to get people's homes built back up when you know, obviously insurance is there for a reason. But whatever insurance doesn't cover, can't cover, your federal government should be able to step in and take care of the people, the taxpayers that are actually paying the taxes into the system. When we're giving, in the last two years, we've given $175 billion to Ukraine and then $17.8 billion to Israel. Obviously, what's going on over there uh, is terrible. And, you know, there's wars going on and people losing their lives. But at the end of the day, the United States should take care of the United States taxpayers and, and United States small businesses that help our economy. Because if we can't help ourselves, what are we doing? We're providing aid to two other wars right now. So that's just my two cents. So if you are a small business owner affected by recent disasters, again, I'd love for you all to uh, say something in the comments section or reach out. Uh, I would love to hear what your all's experiences have been. How do you feel that uh, the government ran out of money and it doesn't have enough to cover all of the damages done, at least for now. You know, now it's a waiting game. So who knows if that money will ever come in. All right, as we shift from the concerns surrounding the SBA running out of EIDL funds, let's take a look at another pressing issue affecting small business owners. Seattle has an upcoming increase in their minimum wage tax and it's going up to $20.76 an hour. Uh, the old rule, uh, that provided some small businesses a break is set to expire at the end of this year. That was where if you were paying, I believe it was $2.76 to each worker, I think it was like per hour, if that was going to their insurance and medical benefits or, or retirement, you, you could lower the minimum wage down to what it was like $17 an hour, $17.50 an hour. 
So they did give small businesses somewhat of a break in the last 10 years that Seattle had this, they made it where the minimum wage was increasing every year, but that was the law. Uh, but now that old rule goes away, it expires at the end of the year for small businesses. So small businesses, any large businesses are going to be paying the same um, as far as the minimum wage. So this increase means that uh, small business owners in Seattle, you will face yet another financial hurdle adding to the pressures you already are experiencing from inflation and high living costs in the area. I would love to hear you all in the comment section, how you feel about this rule change. Do you think it's good for your Seattle? Or do you think it's not? Again, for many entrepreneurs, managing payroll costs can be challenging, especially in a city where the cost of living is already steep. This wage hike could compel some business owners to reevaluate their staffing strategies, potentially leading to difficult decisions regarding employee hours, hiring, or even retaining talent. Uh, so as expenses continue to rise, small business owners in Seattle must adapt to the shifting landscape. How can you all ensure your Seattle businesses remain sustainable amidst these raising costs? And a positive develop development for small businesses, though, Rhode Island has recently received $1.6 million in grants aimed at lo supporting local entrepreneurs. This funding will provide crucial assistance, offering technical support, legal and accounting services, especially for businesses in the construction, transportation, and renewable energy sectors. These grants are part of the State Small Business Credit Initiative, or SSCBI, under the America Small Business Opportunity Program. Uh, so how can this funding impact the future growth and sustainability of small businesses in Rhode Island? Glad you asked. By addressing critical needs and technical assistance and legal support, this initiative aims to power small business owners to navigate challenges more effectively. The support could be a game changer for many in the targeted industries, helping them enhance their operational capabilities and ultimately contribute to the local Rhode Island economy. In a significant move to support small businesses, Goldman Sachs is expanding its $100 million small business program, recently allocating $10 million to the great state of Minnesota. This marks the program seventh state out of a play to 20, and it highlights the vital role small businesses play in the state's economy, making up 99.5% of all businesses and employing nearly half of all Minnesotans. In 2023, Goldman Sachs announced this extension of investment Further 10,000 small businesses program in rural communities across the country, aiming to bolster job creation and economic. This funding is particularly uh, crucial for rural small business owners, addressing key issues such as attracting workers, where 62% of rural small business owners report challenges as far as attracting more workers to their business, whereas only 41% of their non-rural small business owner counterparts. The $100 million initiative includes $75 million directed to uh, the community development financial institution. $15 million is allocated for the 10,000 small businesses education program at local community colleges and $10 million in access to capital capacity building grants. This program is designed to tackle pressing concerns such as inflation, difficulty accessing basic services, and the lack of affordable housing. Since its inception over a decade ago, it has supported over 14,000 businesses nationwide with 74% of rural businesses reporting revenue growth and 72% expanding their workforce. The $10 million earmarked for Minnesota will be distributed through, I don't know how to say this, but I'm going to try OESTA, OESTA Corporation, OESTA, the longest standing native CDFI intermediary. It will also fund small business educational classes at St. Cloud Technical and Community College. So how will this new funding transform the landscape for small businesses in Minnesota? We'll keep you updated on the progress and impact of this significant investment from Goldman Sachs. In our final segment today, let's explore the 10 best places to start a business according to a recent study by Coworking Cafe. This analysis considered various factors, including the growth rate of business application, the percentage of self-employed business owners, GDP growth, labor costs, cost of living index, and the unemployment rate, among other factors. Interesting, 14 of the top 20 locations are based in the South. So let's take a look at the top 10. Okay, number 10, Huntsville, Alabama. With low un unemployment and labor costs, Huntsville is recognized for its thriving tech and research sector. Um, number nine, McAllen, Texas, home to the highest self-employment rate, ranking fifth nationwide. McAllen is known for its strong logistics and retail industry. And number eight, Boise, Idaho. This city boasts a low cost of living, making it an attractive option for new entrepreneurs. 
Uh, so if you all like the mountains and like it a little cold, Boise might be for you. Heard it's very pretty up there. Number seven, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, ranking number four nationwide for self-employment rates. Fort Lauderdale has a higher cost of living, but reasonable labor costs. It's known for its marine, tourism, and tech industries. On the beach, close to Miami, you know, if that's your thing. And number six, Tampa, Florida. Tampa features below the national average cost of living and moderate labor costs, creating a favorable environment for startups. Didn't know that. I, I figured Tampa being right on, you know, I guess it's on a bay, but it's close to the beach. You have the water, you have the beach. You know, I'm surprised that the living costs are, are lower there. So taxes are great in Florida, that's for sure. At number five, Austin, Texas. Austin is known for its highly educated workforce and very low unemployment rate, although it does have higher labor costs. The city has experienced an impressive 46% GDP growth. Austin, Texas, full and cool town. Number four, Orlando, Florida. Mickey Mouse, nearly 4% of residents applying to start new businesses. Orlando maintains moderate living and labor costs and is well known for its tourism, creative, and tech industries. Number three, Atlanta, Georgia, ranks number one for the number of co-working spaces available. While it has higher than average labor costs, it is home to a highly educated workforce and recognized for its tech, media, and logistics sectors. Uh, let's do number two, Miami. Miami, Florida, leading the nation in new business applications at 5.32%. Miami has an 18% self-employment rate, so very high self-employment rate. Uh, despite a very high cost of living, the city benefits from lower taxes and is known for its finance, tech, and logistics sectors. I think everybody in New York left to Miami over uh, COVID. Number one, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, didn't didn't expect this. Topping the list, Scottsdale boasts a remarkable 38% growth in GDP. With 16% of its population self-employed, it also benefits from a low disaster risk and excellent infrastructure. But it is extremely hot over the summer, that's for sure. I tried to play golf there one time, and it was 110 at the uh, championship course where they play the waste management. So it gets really hot, and there's dust storms, but I guess there's no tornadoes ripping through there or anything like that or hurricanes so low disaster risk and also scottsdale how are you gonna count like scottsdale and fort lauderdale on this list you know i guess fort lauderdale is 30 45 minutes away from miami but scottsdale is like 15 minutes from phoenix so it's just funny that they consider that its own city okay but as you consider the best locations to launch or grow your business these cities offer promising environments tailored to various industries so we just want to know from you guys, are you all considering starting a business in one of these areas or what, do you have any problems with the list? We'd love to hear your all's thoughts on that list there. Okay, as we wrap up today's report, if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe to the channel. It's free, doesn't cost you anything, and it helps us out, keeps the channel alive for you guys to catch more daily insights and news on the small business financing world. We've covered several important topics affecting small businesses. We discussed the troubles of the SBA running out of funds for EIDL and physical damage loans, leaving many entrepreneurs in a precarious situation. Um, hopefully, Congress can convene here shortly. We then examined the Im implications of Seattle raising its minimum wage tax in $20.76 an hour. That's crazy to me. Kentucky is still seven twenty-five dollars in the corner. Um, so I don't know how you all do it there unless you're charging like $30 for a sandwich. Obviously, that's going to add financial pressures to you guys, and you already have inflation and high living costs. In a positive turn, Rhode Island received that $1.6 million in grants to support small businesses, highlighting efforts to provide much-needed technical assistance and resource to entrepreneurs in key industries. Um, Goldman Sachs, uh, $10 million investment in Minnesota through its $100 million small business program aims to boost job creation and economic growth in rural areas, addressing crucial challenges faced by small business owners. And then finally, we explore the top 10 best places to start a business, showcasing cities that provide favorable conditions for entrepreneurs with a low tax, good labor force, and good GDP growth. Thanks again for watching the video, and we'll catch you in the next one.